Today, I want to talk about the game Heroes of Hammerwatch. Heroes of Hammerwatch is a roguelite pixelated ARPG with an amazingly good art style. And I think about a nice pixelated art style, I think about Heroes of Hammerwatch. The game is the second game in the Hammerwatch franchise, with Hammerwatch being the first and Hammerwatch 2 being the third once it releases. Looking at you, Crackshell, any minute now. Before I talk about the game, I want to briefly talk about the game development studio first. The development studio is called Crackshell, and they have a great sense of humor. Their website looks like it is made by someone with absolutely no experience with web development, just promoting their games and a stock image as their team, which I find hilarious. After searching far and wide, I went to their Twitter account. I found a link that shows you a list of people working at Crackshell, which turned out to be the most blank website I've ever seen in my life, which obviously fits their style. So I took the most dramatic measures imaginable to find out more about their team. I watched the credits. And lo and behold, there's a full list of people that worked on the game. Thanks to all of you. You people made two amazing games. And I am looking forward to having watched two. Sorry, I haven't played your serious Sam game. But one side note. Why do you state on your site that the team is sitting in a beautiful location in Stockholm while using a Danish domain? <laughs> you got anything to hide? Or maybe I'm just interpreting things too much. Now, without further ado, let's talk about the game. I'll divide the game into three parts. Base game and the two content DLCs, The Pyramid of Prophecy and The Moon Temple. Since there is a lot to talk about for each part, in Heroes of Hammerwatch there are nine classes. Paladin, Ranger, Sorcerer, Warlock, Thief, Priest, Wizard, Gladiator and Witch Hunter. In the base game there are seven of them, from which three have to be unlocked through playing the game. The remaining two have to be bought the Gladiator comes with the Pyramid of Prophecy DLC and the Witch Hunter has to be bought separately. Each class has different skills and therefore plays differently. The Paladin is a melee class with a 290 degree projectile block, a dash ability, a close area of effect healing ability and a whirlwind. The Ranger is a ranged class that shoots single arrows with a chance to split and a chance to bounce on impact with walls as well as a arrow rain, a root ability, and a piercing shot. The sorcerer is a frost mage that shoots frost projectile that bounce off of enemies, a frost comet, a frost nova, and a blizzard orb that travels in a straight line. The warlock is a special class. The standard attack is a melee dagger step that applies poison and on kill will leech life and mana. The Warlock also can shoot thunderbolts, spawn gargoyles, and conjure a thunderstorm. The Thief is a dagger-wielding melee class that can deal high damage but is more vulnerable. The Thief has a dagger throw, a grappling hook, that will pull the Thief towards the impact point, and a smoke bomb. The Priest is a healer class with a high amount of survivability. The standard attack of the Priest is a short range. Might. The Priester can also cast a ray that will heal allies and damage enemies, as well as Consecrated Ground that will heal everyone in sight for the damage it caused towards enemies. And on top of that, the Priest has a passive that summons Celestial Orbs that fire beams at enemies nearby, dealing moderate damage. The Wizard is like the Sorcerer, a mage. But instead of frost, the wizard conjures the element of fire. The wizard shoots firebolt, has a fire breath, a blast wave, and a meteor shower ability, always paired with a burning debuff. The gladiator is a trident wheeling, dominating melee machine that is almost unstoppable. The gladiator can throw a net that roots enemies, as well as orbs that will start spinning on impact. And on top of that, the gladiator can summon three pit fighters to his side that will annihilate every enemy nearby. 
The Witch Hunters, then their attack is a burst of three crossbow bolts. The Witch Hunter can cast a Flaming Hound that will bounce in one direction and it will deal increased damage with each bounce as well as the ability to place a ward on the ground that will work as a mine, dealing damage to enemies that step on it. The Witch Hunter can also place a Witch Pyre that will deal massive damage to nearby enemies. In Heroes of Hammer Watch there is a mechanic called Combo, which will provide you with a buff after you killed 10 enemies within a short amount of time. This buff has a lot of synergies with items. It will let you cast the mobilities while moving, as well as use the basic attack without getting locked in place for a split second. The combo mechanic has to be unlocked by entering the portal on the first floor in the run after you defeated the first boss. Onwards to the town, which works as a hub where you can prepare for your dungeon run and in exchange for or upgrade the buildings which in return let you upgrade your class furthermore in exchange for gold. Gold and ore can be obtained in the dungeon that I will talk about later in the video. There are a lot of buildings in the town which can be upgraded in the town hall, but to upgrade the buildings you have to upgrade the town hall first. Each of the buildings provides you with different things and buffs. As explained, the town hall is needed to upgrade other buildings. The treasury will reduce the taxes applied when returning gold and ore out of the dungeon. Those will apply even if you clear the dungeon and max out at 50% tax rate for a gold amount above 30k. The guild hall will let you build higher tiers of skills. You earn skill points by leveling, but you can only spend them on the tiers of spells that are on the same rank or lower than your guild hall. The guild hall will also grant you permanent buffs for and from each class after defeating certain bosses. The general store will let you buy items inside the town before entering the dungeon, as well as keys to open chests inside the dungeon. For each tier of the general store, the amount of buyable items increases as well as their rarity. And if you don't like the items presented, you can re-roll, as long as you don't have bought any item. The blacksmith will let you increase melee stats like attack power, armor, melee crit and crit damage, and movement speed. The ore trader lets you buy and sell ore to outrageous prices, those will better the higher upgraded the ore trader is. At the end. Apothecary. Apothecary? You can buy upgrades to your potion like the amount of charges, the amount of healing and mana regain, as well as the amount of health and mana you recover from items inside the dungeon. The fountain is a little special. It will provide you with good and bad effects for your run, which you can choose. Positive effects will gain positive favor, which you have to compensate with gold, or you add negative effects to even out the favor. A result you are comfortable with and willing to pay. The chapel will provide you with unique buffs as well as the priest class. Those buffs generally increase the damage you can deal or your survivability. The tavern will let you gamble, but trust me, you'll always lose. As well as it lets you buy a limited amount of beverages that will grant you special buffs, and on top of that, the tavern unlocks the thief class. The buffs from the beverages do come with a negative effect and the amount you can buy for one run is limited to 5. And the last building is the magic shop, which is the equivalent to the blacksmith, just for magic stats. You can increase magic resistance, skill damage, skill crit chance and skill crit damage. And on top of that, the magic shop unlocks the wizard glass. There are a couple more NPCs in the city. There's a merchant for pets, pets will pick up any gold or ore that is in your view distance. Arbor NPC, where you can change the appearance of your character. Then there's a monster Nomicon, which has to be found in the fourth act of the Forsaken Tower dungeon in the library. The monster Nomicon lets you increase the damage you deal against certain types of monsters or your unused skill points, which will only come in play after New Game Plus. And lastly, there's 
the anvil where you can craft an item for ore on top of the limited items you can buy at the merchant those crafted items can be attuned by spending leftover skill points to double their effect before i talk about the dungeon that you have to clear in heroes of Hammer watch i want to talk about the items items can have one out of five rarities common white uncommon green rare blue epic purple and legendary red items have vastly different effects some will only provide you with basic stats some are more advanced stats and some will provide you with special effects with increasing rarity the strength of those effects increases as well legendary items will provide extremely useful buffs like a three second invulnerability after getting hit or enemies you look at getting slowed for 50% and their armor reduced by 50%. A lot of items have set effects which get stronger the more parts of the set you have. For example there is a ton of items called gears which will provide you with a amazing buff for your combos. For example casting a nova of projectiles that deal damage. The dungeon in Heroes of Hammer Watch is called the Forsaken Tower. And it has six different acts, with each of the first four acts having three floors and the last two having only two floors. Each act has different enemies, but the enemies in the second, third and fifth act are really similar. Most of the enemies fit their environment. The first act, the mines, has only insectoids and beasts, like beetles, snakes, larvae and bats, with no special objective. In the second act, the prison, there are skeletons with different classes like warrior, archer and mage. You can find a hidden switch that will open the cell doors. In the third act, the armory, the enemies are skeletons, with the addition of some caster types that will resurrect the undead upon death and they'll respawn as ghosts. The third act is the first with a objective. The objective is to slay all the statues placed in each floor. Once attacked, will start spawning ghosts. In the fourth act, the archives, the enemies consist of giant eyeballs, energy orbs, and ghosts. The objective in the archives is to find summoning books to defeat the boss. The fifth act, the chambers, has undead type enemies with a great variety in classes like knight, warrior, archer, and sorcerer. Sometimes there are some energy orbs out of act four. The objective in the chambers is to collect as many wooden crosses as needed to defeat the boss, which only depends on the damage you can deal as a player or with your character. The sixth and the last act has not that much variety in enemies. There are gargoyles, ice trolls and ballistas. The gargoyles sometimes spawn when you pass by a statue. The ice trolls are either a melee that will leap towards you or a caster that will cast frost spells. The ballista are either loaded with normal arrows that will damage you or with nets that will snare you. There is no objective in the last act, just survive, which will be hard enough, since the enemies in the last act deal massive damage. There are some things that all the acts have in common. Each act has the event of a great threat spawning that will trigger after a certain amount of time is spent on the floor, so don't linger around too long. Normally, the great threat will spawn some normal enemies and in act 1 and 4 a mini boss as well. After you defeated the boss of the act you unlocked the portal on the first floor of the act for your next run to skip the three floors of the act. Once you enter the portal there will be a cube that you have to destroy which will pose a little challenge. After defeating the cube you will be rewarded with a bunch of items. Depending on the act, the rarity of the items is adjusted. Oh yeah, I forgot to talk about the boss fights. Yeah, I won't do that. This is something you gotta find out for yourself. I just wanna say, every boss has some mechanics and that they'll pose a challenge for new players. Inside every act, there will be a shop at which you can buy up to three items from a selection of five or seven if you have the item, the fancy plume as well as a spring or a fountain at which you can replenish your potion. Every level has chests. The amount varies greatly, but the further you get, the more chests per level you can find. 
most of the chests will require you to survive a trap, which in some cases can be deactivated after successful survival. Chests come in five different rarities, wooden, bronze, silver, gold and ace, and will contain a item with one exception for the wooden chest, which can contain money sometimes. The chest rarity mostly corresponds with the rarity of the item inside, but chests have a chance to contain lower and higher grade items. On each floor, in every act, you can encounter a bunch of things. There are breakable and illusionary walls, which most of the times hide items, chests or events. Those events can be a room where you only have to activate a switch that will reward you with random stuff. Or some kind of puzzle, where you have to find out the right order in which you to activate the pressure plates on the ground. Or sometimes you have to remember a sequence which you will have to repeat. You can also encounter shrines and altars. Shrines will grant you a temporary buff without any repercussions. Altars on the other hand will grant you a random permanent buff or a sacrifice of 10% of your max health. Sometimes there will pop up a message that someone is waiting for you, which means that a imp spawned nearby. This imp will always have positive effect, like giving you gold or keys, or he'll send your gold and ore to the town without applying taxes. He is what the mayor fears the most. The gameplay loop in Heroes of Hammerwatch is pretty easy. You prepare for entering the dungeon, Buy your items at the general store, set your positive and negative effects at the fountain, maybe grab some beverages in the tavern and then enter the mines. You will start in the mines where you will have to clear three floors. The first two are not that hard. You will collect a few items, encounter some traps, chests and maybe one or two events. You will discover the shop and buy three items from which you misclicked one. On the third floor you will encounter mini bosses, which are a bit challenging. After clearing the third floor, you will enter the boss room and try defeating the first boss. If you succeed, you can proceed into the next act. This pattern continues for the next three acts and you will amass a great amount of gold, ore and items. Those items are needed for the later acts and floors, especially if your character does not have a lot of upgrades. The difficulty of Heroes of Hammerwatch gradually increases. Some tips and tricks I used to do. Most of the times I tried to get the pickaxe, the dwarven pickaxe and Makam's stone. Since they will increase your ore gain and ore does not get taxed. I normally make sure to at least start with one of these items. Sometimes two. Through rerolling the general store and crafting an item. At the anvil. Always take last walk at the fountain. It is worth every favor you have to compensate. If you often die to traps, which I did a lot, take gentle traps at the fountain as well. Enemy reinforcement, stronger enemies and enemy overseers normally are my go-to negative choices at the fountain. If you have a good amount of beverages collected and available in the tavern, you can use a combination of five of them. My go-to is on the run, Miner's Delight, Lazy Stroll, if you still need XP, if not, Mellow Mist and a Fool's Errand. Those will provide you with 100% more ore gain, plus, plus and minus 100% gold gain, plus and minus 0.4 movement speed, zero health regeneration, and depending on what you choose, 50% EXP or minus 10% damage taken. For gameplay tricks, Always use corners, most of the enemy camps have some kind of range enemy which do hurt a lot, so break their line of sight as much as possible. If you want to use the portal, make sure you clear the floor you are on before entering. Most of the time you will get one or two items. Always buy keys in the general store. If you manage to get to act 4 and beyond, you will need a lot of silver and gold keys. Before that, bronze and silver will do. Always buy free items at the shop, if you have the gold to spare, even if you don't need any of the items. If you have them, they can't be in a chest. Oh yeah, I think I forgot to mention that. Since this is a roguelite, 
you will lose everything on your character if you die inside the Forsaken Tower. Thus, I'll advise you to use the elevator before a new boss. Now, let's talk about the first add-on, the Pyramid of Prophecy. The hub area or town has most of the NPCs needed to prepare for a run. The fountain, the general store and the tavern. The add-on introduced two new major character enchanting possibilities. The first being a Roman style Colosseum called Aridara Arena. The arena has 15 ranks of difficulty and you have to fight multiple waves for each rank with a boss fight in the last wave. The arena is full of traps which will randomly acti activate at the start of each wave. You collect items at the mercy of the crowd. They'll sometimes throw a bag into the pit which contains food, mana crystals or items. The frequency of which the crowd will reward you with a bag depends on their amusement, which is defined by your kill speed. After you successfully cleared all the waves and defeated the boss, you will be rewarded with gold or EXP and sword tokens. Those tokens can be used to increase your basic stats like attack power, skill power, armor and resistance. But you will also need gold to increase those stats. The second new major enchanting possibility are statues. You can build up to three statues that will provide unique effects to your character. But before building those, you need to find their blueprints while clearing the dungeon. On top of finding blueprints, you need a high amount of ore to build a statue. And if you want to upgrade the statue, you have to find another blueprint with a higher rank. There is no limit to the ranks of the statues but the ore cost gets extremely high. Now let's talk about the dungeon in this add-on. This one is called the City of Stone. It consists of three acts, the desert, the lower pyramid and the upper pyramid, with three floors for each act. In this dungeon, you will be introduced to a new system. The system revolves around curses, which you will obtain if you decided to loot any items out of the suck Sarcophagus. Sarcophagus. There are five items in the sarcophagus, and you can choose how many and which ones you want to loot. The rarity of the items, as well as the amount of items you choose to pick, increases the amount of curses you receive. Curses can also be obtained through various traps inside the lower and upper pyramid, as well as some of the mini bosses. You probably are wondering. What does curses do and why should you care about them? Curses will decrease your chance to hit and also increase the enemy's chance to hit you critically, as well as the amount they'll hit you for, which in return means if you are unlucky, a single hit can one-shot you, if you have too many curses stacked. But fear not, throughout the run there will be potions, events and items that will reduce curses. The events are restricted to the upper pyramid and the items are of the new introduced queen's set, which has the set effect of lowering the amount of current curses. First act, the desert, is a vastly open area which contains four types of enemies. Snakes, scorpions, sandstone golems and gold scarves, which will drop gold nuggets if you kill them. The mini boss here is a giant scorpion. On each of the floors, in the desert there will be a merchant. That merchant sells the items from which you can buy only one and a map. The map shows you the way to the next floor. If you choose to not follow the right path which resembles the safest path you will encounter great threats in the form of sandstorms that will slow you down. One positive thing about the desert is that there are no traps. On a side note there will be a special symbol that you can find, which you should take note of. This can be used in the second act. The second act is the lower pyramid and is in a ruin-like state. The enemies are undead snakes and spiders. The mini boss in this act is a mummy, which will make your life really difficult. Some of the mummy's abilities will stack curses on you if you get hit. 
which makes the mummy a high priority target. The great threat is a swarm of snakes and spiders. The blessing that Act 1 was in terms of traps, Act 2 and 3 are nightmares. There'll be rolling boulders that instantly kill you sometimes, stomping blocks and curse applying mines and tiles. There will be a special event in the second act at which you have to input a symbol found in the first act on a 5 to 5 grid of pressure plates. If you correctly input, you will receive a random item whose rarity can go all the way up to legendary. The third act is the upper pyramid and looks more like a temple with ornaments and gold scattered around. The enemies in the act are a variety of undead, stone statues and jinns. The mini boss is a strong stone statue. To change the floors in this act, you'll have to activate a portal and defeat a few jinns that will spawn. Once you cleared all the jinns that spawned, you can use the portal to enter the jinns dimension, where you got to survive until the transition is complete. Once the transition is complete, it will automatically port it to the next floor. Tips and tricks as in every act, try to use corners to break the line of sight if possible. Avoid stacking too many curses, but make sure you don't waste the potions scattered around different floors by not taking any curses in the first place. If you are not 100% confident in clearing a trap, don't do it if you want to continue your run. Traps in the pyramid can really easily kill you. For the fountain, I'll recommend taking glass walk gentle traps and safe corridors. Safe corridors remove some of the traps in the pyramid, which will make your life easier. I don't recommend using the tavern if you have no experience about the expansion. For the statues, you are at the mercy of RNG with the blueprints you will find, so don't stress it too much. For the arena, there aren't any tricks. Just be good and level your character to survive. The arena scales with not point Three new game plus per rank, which means arena rank 3 is almost equal to new game plus 1. Now let's talk about the second add-on, the moon temple. I had a vague understanding of the dungeon, but I was not sure about it. So in order to cut time, I thought I should turn to the wiki to update the information I got about it. But the wiki was not updated for the moon temple. Maybe, just maybe, there's a correlation between the overwhelmingly negative reviews on Steam and the wiki not being fleshed out for this add-on. But enough speculation. Nevertheless, I had to enter the Moon Temple and complete it and update my knowledge. The Moon Temple has, like, like the Pyramid of Prophecy, three acts, but only two floors per act. The Moon Temple is a magical place, but there are no doors in the common sense. The doors are teleporters that sometimes choose to teleport you to a random other door. This is somewhat annoying, combined with the fact that you can only leave a room after defeating every last enemy in that room, this mechanic can become quite dangerous. Each of the floors in the Moon Temple add-on are gigantic, compared to the floors in the base game or the Pyramid of Prophecy, but they are not open, so you sometimes have to backtrack vast distances. The rooms throughout the temple are either small corridors or big rooms. Small corridors won't provide you much hard cover, which makes them quite hard to deal with. The big rooms are typically packed to the brim with enemies, spawners and traps. In all of the moon temple, you will encounter pillars at the walls that will light up and fire a target seeking ground spike impulse, which is really annoying to deal with. Speaking of annoying, the gold inside the moon temple is frozen inside ice, which has to be broken. This makes it really tedious to play this add-on. Why do I have a pet that collects gold and ore if I have to walk there to free the gold in the first place? The first act is called the Outer Halls and is comprised of a lot of small rooms that make up the two floors. Most of the enemies are vampire type enemies, like in the fifth act of the Forsaken Tower. 
with some pets in between and frozen plants that will create random ground spikes in a big area around the player. There are no mini bosses and no great threats in the first act, or let's say I did not encounter any and I cleared every room in my playthrough. In hindsight, I got to make some adjustments after we watching the footage. I noticed that I did encounter a mini boss in the first act. But since I played on a lower difficulty to make it through the dungeon quickly, I didn't even notice the difference. It seems though that the miniboss is a vampire that has a aura which revives enemies once after defeating as well as itself. After revival the miniboss turns into a more fleshy mob type which probably hits harder. The second act is called the inner halls and is mostly the same as the first act, same environment, same enemies, with two changes. The bats are no more. Instead, there are frost orbs that will explode upon death or shoot a salve of frost projectiles at you. And instead of the plant constructs, there are now frost crystals that have a variety of projectiles in their arsenal. The mini bosses are giant bats that will charge at you and screech shooting multiple energy rings or bubbles in front of them in a cone formation. The great threat in this act is a invasion of the room you are in by a bunch of bulky stone guards. The third act is called the inner sanctum and has two massive floors. On both of the floors you have a objective. That objective is to collect three insignias that are held by some badass stone guards that are scattered around the floor. The mini bosses are more bulky stone guards with some abilities. The great threat in this act is a swarm of shadowy ghosts that will darken your sight if you get hit by one of their spells. The only tip or trick I can give you is to get the dwarven pickaxe for any dungeon run. Quite a few enemies are regarded as constructs so it is pretty useful. Now let's talk about the fact that Heroes of Hammerwatch is playable by up to 4 players. The enemies scale really good with the amount of players inside the run. In the multiplayer mode everyone can loot items out of chests and secrets. Everyone gets the gold and ore found. But buying at the shop inside the dungeon will only lower your own money. This is really convenient. Imagine having to share the collected gold with your friends and figuring out who should buy what item. That would be a nightmare. If you die in the multiplayer, you can be, be revived by your friends. But be careful. You and the friend that revived you will be linked. And if one of you dies again, the other one will die too. There's a graveyard that can only be encountered in multiplayer mode that will unlink every player linked. Only the person hosting the lobby has to upgrade the town. The other players can profit off of that and increase the stats of their own character. But be warned, if you ever want to play solo, you have to upgrade all the buildings for yourself. Now I want to give my own opinion about the game. Heroes of Hammerwatch is in my opinion the best roguelite ARPG out there. The art style is super nice and the sound effects are good. The progression of the game is pretty decent and there's a lot of stuff to do. The possibilities to upgrade your character are nicely done. There are a lot of things that will strengthen your character, but most of them are limited so you won't have to endlessly grind. Playing different classes is rewarding since they provide you with buffs for every class. There's a shortcut mechanic once you killed the boss of the act which cuts the time you need to clear again massively. Items, especially with the set effects, feel really empowering. The multiplayer makes a lot of fun. The only thing I don't like is that you get taxed if you clear the dungeon. The base game is an absolute blast. And I would recommend the game to everyone that has just a little bit of interest in any of the key factors of the game. Roguelite, ARPG and Pixelated. The first add-on is a nice addition to the game and feels great. It is made with a lot of care and love. It is also a welcoming change in scenery if you've cleared the tower multiple times. One run 
through the pyramid will spice things up a bit. The moon temple on the other hand is not that great. The excessive size of the maps, the random teleportations and the frozen gold does not make it a pleasant experience. But this is just my opinion, so feel free to get a game for yourself and try it. Make your own opinion about it. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and that it was of help for you. It would mean a lot to me if you could leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it. And feel free to comment down below.